Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar in Risk and Management Portfolio. My name is Alba Kecha, the organizer of this webinar. Today's webinar will be on risk management in IT intensive SMEs, which will be presented by Yasmina Traikovsky, Managing Director of Traikovsky and Partners Consulting, who has more than 15 years of experience in IT consulting. Understanding how processes are executed is essential, essential for all companies. Therefore, this live webinar will cover very useful and interesting topics such as risk management process in IT uh, intensive SMEs, challenges for users for, of generic risk management methodologies, overview of simplified risk management methodologies for IT intensive SMEs. Before Yas Yasmina begins his presentation, uh, I would like to ask the audience to please write down any questions you may have during the webinar in the chat box on your control panel and we'll respond to, to a few of them at the end uh, and, and answer to the remaining through email. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the session. Yasmina, you may begin the presentation. Thank you. Um, I hope everybody can hear me well. My name is Yasmina Drakowski and as, uh, as I was introduced, uh, I'm a managing director of a um, small consulting company focusing on IT governance. Um, otherwise, my organizational background is in IT, computer science, and management. And I think that these three areas provide a good fit between um, the specifics of use of technology for improvement of business and the operations, and on the other side, of what is important to that business in terms of uh, how it can provide its services or product better. Um, over the past 15 years, as um, you've heard, uh, I've had experience with different types of companies, both from the public and the private sector. But I always like most to work with um, small and micro, uh, and micro companies who are IT intensive. Because there I think that, our, uh, that my experience and knowledge can be best um, suited for uh, improvement of their operations. These companies are from generally the Balkan region, but also from other parts of Europe, um, North Africa, um, and uh, I would say the um, Saudi Arabian Peninsula as well. Um, so that was shortly who I am. Um, my latest challenge is actually doing a PhD on the same topic, risk management frameworks for IT-centric micro and small enterprises, and that led me to my desire to contribute to this um, webinar today. I hope that over the next 35, 40 minutes, you would um, uh, bear with me to hear my thoughts about how risk management should be customized to fit the needs of such companies, what are the challenges, and how um, what benefits these companies can get from using um, risk management. So just briefly, um, as you can see, the content of my uh, webinar will first uh, focus on overview, overview of risk and risk management frameworks. Um, then we will bring this down to the specifics of uh, IT-centric micro and small companies. Afterwards, we will talk about, or I will talk about, and you can pose any questions you want, about how a new uh, framework should be made with the elements from the existing frameworks, but in such a way that it can be of use to micro and small enterprises. And finally, we'll talk about the challenges for implementation, because implementing risk management is not easy in big companies, and it's even harder maybe in smaller companies. Um, but before I continue to to my, the core of my presentation, I would like to explain what are IT-centric micro and small enterprises. These are companies which are usually uh, less than 50 people. So from startups with one or two employees to companies up to 50 people who are either working on IT development or software development, provision of IT services, or are in another field but use IT um, in every part of their operations. They use the IT systems or um, the information uh, for processing to provide their services. Uh, why have I chosen this type of companies? This is primarily because they have specific risks which are not there in other traditional companies like um, stores and, and so on. Because their core component is 
data, information, IT systems that are processing it, and how they deal with it in order to provide good quality product or service to the market. So after saying all this, um, let's look what risk is. Here are some definitions of this slide about what risk is. So it's stated as the broadest possible definition that risk is effect of uncertainty on objectives. And as you can see here, it never says that it's bad. It simply says that it is what uncertainty does to the objectives of an organization or of a company. In general, most companies and most people, when they think of risk, things are, uh, think of negative uh, consequences. But also there are positive consequences, and in those cases, the, those positive risks are usually termed opportunities. These frameworks that I will talk about today cover both, but knowing that companies are more frightened or scared of the negative risks, we will uh, focus on those. So, what are some types of risks that uh, IT-intensive micro and small companies can have? Um, there are plenty, but um, here for the purposes of this presentation or, or this webinar, I would like to focus on um, three of them. One of them is IT risk, and the definition provided in the slide is from ISACA, an international organization about um, information systems audit and control which says that uh, IT risk is the business risk associated with the use, ownership, operation, involvement, and influence of IT within an enterprise. So as we said, we're focusing on IT-intensive micro and small enterprises, so this risk is straight on, exactly what they have to deal about. But then, um, it's not only the equipment, or not only the IT systems, but also the information which is being processed on those um, uh, IT systems. So that's why the second definition about information security risk is also interested, interesting. And this here is provided from NIST. This is the um, uh, North American or the, the US Institute of Standards and Technologies that ha has come up with a definition that information security risks are all risks associated with um, the use of information systems which are uh, um, supporting the mission critical operations and business functions of the organization, focusing as well on the information being processed. And if, if we want to move aside from uh, IT-focused uh, definitions of risk, the, the last one on the slide is about operational risk. And this comes from the Basel Committee, which is actually defining risk management for um, financial institutions. And here they say that operational risk is the indirect uh, direct, uh, indirect loss resulting from inadequate of, or failed internal processes, people, or systems, or from external events. What I like in this definition is that it brings into risk the factor of people, not only systems, but also processes, and it says that it can be both internal or external. Looking at all these definitions together, we can um, see how all of these aspects are something which is of relevance for the IT-intensive micro and small enterprises and how somehow in, in this new framework that um, should be proposed to, to such enterprises, all these things, uh, all these elements must find their place. This is, I think, my last definition for, um, for this webinar, so just bear with me. It's a definition about enterprise risk management and why I chose to to put it here. It's because I think that risk cannot be, risk management cannot be an isolated activity. It has to be an integrated activity for the whole company, especially when we're talking about micro and small enterprises. Because everything they do, it's all related to uh, one process to, to the other, that it has to be somehow intertwined with everything because risks for the uh, micro and small enterprises, especially the IT intensive ones, can come from every specific aspect of their operations. So that's why here the definition from COSA about um, enterprise risk management is that it is a process, and this is the important word, it is a process, which means that it's something that has uh, some inputs, processes those inputs, gives some outputs, and then those have to be checked if they're effective and efficient, and if not, then it should um, be repeated. But anyway, um, it's a process to manage risk to, uh, within the risk appetite of the organization or the individual doing the risk assessment, 
in order to provide a reasonable assurance regarding achievement of the company or organization's objectives. So if we're done with all the um, definitions, let's continue to what are the currently available uh, risk management frameworks. And as you can see on the slide, this is just a short summary of some 10 of, uh, 10 of them which currently exist on the market or which are available for companies to use. Some of them are generic. For example, um, ISO 30, uh, 31000. It is a standard on how risk management should be conducted in a company. And this applies to any type of organization. Um, then there are some uh, risk management frameworks focusing on information security because we said that this is also an important risk for such companies. And here is uh, ISO 27005, which is um, a member of the family of standards regarding information security or some other, as I mentioned here, from, uh, from NIST or from other organizations. And they all focus on information security risk. Uh, the next one are frameworks for uh, IT risk management and for operational risk management. And as you can see, and as any uh, micro and small company with a short internet search can find, all of these are available. You can find information on them, but then when you try to use them, you get into a problem because they are hard to implement in small, uh, in small companies. Um, that's why I decided for this, uh, for the purpose of this web webinar, to focus on the most generic one, which is, um, which is ISO 31000, because that one can be most easily adapted to the needs of a micro and small company. And also, because it is so generic, it can include any type of, type of risks that we would like to take into consideration. So let's talk a little bit about how this um, standard looks like and what is the framework which it covers. So basically, uh, ISO 31000 defines the principles and generic guidelines on how to implement risk management in any type of company. Um, in an industry, in any sector. So what the companies should first do is actually define itself so that it can define the um, operational environment in which such risk management processes should be conducted. Um, who is this standard uh, meant for? It's meant for not only the people who are implementing risk management, but also um, for those who uh, need to ensure that those risks are adequately managed and also for uh, external entities if they need to assess the, the risks which are uh, to which a company is exposed like uh, potential partners or clients or um, banks or other institutions they can all use the same uh, framework for um, evaluating the risks. This following diagram shows the relationship between the core elements of uh, ISO 31000. So the first one is um, the first one. The first uh, part is the principles, and there are several of them, and we'll talk more into detail about them later on. Then is the framework itself, which says what are the main um, segments which need to be addressed, and finally is. Um, and finally is the process, which means which steps have to be conducted within a company so that risks are managed. Well, let's go one by one. What are the principles first? It says that as any other um, process in a company, risk management must create value or you shouldn't do it. Secondly, um, it should be part of the decision making because based on those risks, the, manager, the managers of the company or the employees within the company should be able to make decisions on how to conduct their operations and still uh, have some uh, assurance that they can achieve the objectives. Um, some of the other ones which I would like to um, stress here from the principle is that they should be tailored to the needs of the company. And as we said, we are talking today about IT intensive micro and small companies. So it means that the whole process has to be tailored to their needs, which means it has to be light, it has to be understandable, it has to be something which can be done fairly quickly. Um, it has to take into account um, the complexity of their um, IT systems, of their operations, of their ways that they're dealing with the client, of the human factor or the people who are within the company, and so on. So 
if we take all these eleven principles in mind, we can then continue to the second um, to the second part, which is the framework itself. So, why are we talking about the framework? Um, we're talking and not directly talk about the specific steps. We are talking about the framework because um, it is important before we go into the steps of how uh, we are going to conduct the risk management is that we understand what is our uh, mandate, what is how we define the commitment of the company to implement such risk management, how they will use it, um, how often will they review it, um, what will happen with the results, um, what are the parameters that will be taken into consideration when um, doing the risk assessments. And these all things have to be defined by the management in a micro and small company or by the specific individual who is in charge of risk management prior to actually doing the risk uh, management and the assessment exercises and so on. Because this will put clarity and uh, structure into, into the operations. Um, so if we have that uh, clear, we can go then to what, what is the process? What are the steps specifically? Um, as we said, the risk management process should be an integral part of management because it is actually a tool for the managers, for the owners of the company, uh, to make decisions, to make decisions that will ensure that they will uh, use all the opportunities out there, but that also they will be aware of all the negative things which can happen to them, things which can influence their objectives, which can influence their operations. Um, another uh, part which is important for the risk management, and I've uh, mentioned it several times, is that it has to be something which comes naturally to the people. It has to be embedded in the practices of the company. For example, if they have a sales process, uh, they should somehow embed in the sales process some part of risk assessment. Is that lead uh, worth pursuing? What are the risks with giving an offer? Um, is this something that it is within the culture of our company? Are we a more um, daredevils and want to take on different types of challenges or are we more conservative and we want to play it safe? All this has to be uh, linked together and uh, risk management is one of the processes on how to do that. And finally, um, the process, as mentioned, has to be tailored to the businesses and the organization that it's being conducted upon, uh, primarily because People should easily understand what are they answering, what kind of um, what assets are they thinking about, what type of risks they are exposed to, uh, what does it mean big or small risk, or what does it mean big or small value for uh, for the company before they can, as I said, go into the uh, exercise for assessing the risk and then mitigating the risks. <laughs> So let's look at um, the specific steps. The first step is establishing the context. What does it mean? This means you have to define what your organization is, in which type of area it works. Is it in um, is it in an environment in which there are external external risks, or is it in a safe environment in which only you should consider the internal risks? Um, what are the processes, what are the um, systems which are available, which are used in the daily processes, um, what has more value, what has less value of them for the entire company, which are the assets that you should uh, consider the risks for, um, how will you do it, how will you, what level of, of detail are you going to go into. So after we set this um, big context, um, then next comes the risk assessment. Because now when you know what you are talking about, what is the what is critical, what are the critical assets and values for the company, you should put on a negative hat and say, what can go wrong with all these assets? Uh, and here you should actually um, go into uh, evaluate, identifying what are the risks which can happen. And then go to the next um, step, which is the risks analysis. What triggers these risks? How they impact the company? Um, what can we do about it? And then finally comes the risk evaluation step where you actually say which risk is higher than some other risk so that you can somehow prioritize um, all the risks which you have identified and then try to see with the limited resources that you have for dealing with the risks, 
what kind of risk treatment plans uh, or risk treatment activities um, you can undertake to have the biggest impact on lowering the overall risk of the company. After you do all this, uh, one important part, why is communication and consultation so important? It is important because uh, the person or the management team or the team or wherever within the company that does the risk assessment does not always know what is the impact or what is the value of the specific asset or of the specific risk that you're talking about. So you should always consult with the people who are actually involved in those activities. So for example, if you decide that two, um, two or three person team should work on the overall uh, risk management within the company, you sh uh, when you're doing the um, risk analysis, you should go to the, to the people in the various departments or the various individuals in your company, if, really, if it is a small uh, or a micro company, and ask them, what have you seen, what have you experienced over the past period as possible a risky situation? And what is the impact and how, uh, what triggers such risks? And they should be able to give you a more uh, precise image. Another element for uh, communication and consultation is um, when you come to the evaluation or prioritization of the risks. Because the same risks can have different um, impact on different employees within or people within your company. So, for example, a risk for um, uh, delay of service regarding electronic mail or email for the IT department might be something of medium importance because they might be more focused on the key servers and so on, while for the people who are on a daily basis dealing with clients, delay in email can be very important. So in order to have these two aspects, uh, these two views on the same risk, you have to have both and see who is actually the one, whose actions actually have uh, a higher impact on the overall objectives of the company and then take that one as um, adequate assessment or adequate evaluation of the risk. Um, on the right of the slide you can see also uh, that it says monitoring and review and that, that this should also go through the entire process. Why is this so? This is so because risk management is not a one-off process. It's something that is continuously being done. Depending on the dynamics of the changes within your uh, environment and your company, you should do risk management at least once a year. Maybe even more so on bigger changes. So if something significantly changes in your environment or in your operations, you should also revisit the risk management. Um, and sometimes you should also revisit risk management when significant changes in the people happen. Because new people might have different uh, views on the value of risks or on how uh, you should deal with it. Um, Everything which I've said until now is the same for a micro company or a big company. Now let's see what are the specifics for micro and small companies and um, why they should be taken uh, into consideration when defining a risk management framework. Some of the specifics are that they have very limited resources for risk management, meaning that uh, you don't have an entire department that works on risk management. 24 hours, um, well, not 24 hours, but um, eight hours a day, five days a week. It's not a, a bank with a specific department for this. But it is something that a manager or an owner or some uh, quality manager maybe in the company focuses on uh, sporadically. And you should define a framework which actually can take that into consideration. Another specific of IT-centric micro and small companies is their, uh, their low resilience um, in the operations to risks, meaning that if something, uh, some risks actually uh, happen, it can affect the entire company and it can even stop the operations totally. In bigger companies, this is not so much the problem because they have resilience in terms of uh, multiple sites usually or multiple people or sometimes even multiple systems which can do similar job and take over uh, some of the um, activities which uh, were actually endangered by the um, realization of, of risk. 
And finally, a, a specific of the IT-centric macro and small companies is that they are exposed to various types of risks uh, all at the same time, all for the same people, all, all at the same processes. And that's why some of the specific risk management frameworks that I talked at the beginning are hard to implement because they deal with specific type of risks, not a huge variety of risks that a small company can be exposed to. If, th if those were the specifics, let's now talk about what are the challenges. One of the biggest challenges is that the risk management methodology which uh, the company should implement has to be comprehensive, meaning it must um, include all the aspects and elements uh, for managing risks. And on the other side, it has to be usable within the constraints of a micro and small company, meaning not enough people or few people that can uh, work on this and a small amount of resources available for dealing with the risks. Um, the second challenge is that the approach should be such that it should consistently treat various types of risks. So we cannot have an approach to risk management that only deals with security risks or that only deals with IT risk. It has to deal at the same time with operational risks, management risks, IT risks, information risks, people risks, what any type of risk which you can have in mind because the company can allocate only so much resources and so much time to dealing with risk management and it has to be done nicely. So what is actually the new framework which I'm proposing as part of my uh, PhD research but also which I think that any uh, micro and small company can implement for their own use. The framework can be based on ISO 31000 uh, but it should specifically define the process to be as light as necessary for, for the company with adequate um, ways of measuring um, of measuring the, the risks or of evaluating the risk. It should use specific tools which, an, which will enable the company to efficiently uh, monitor the risks and uh, compare the risks among themselves. And it should involve all the people within the company because, as we said, we are here focusing on micro and small companies and everybody should, in, should be in, involved in such exercises. Let's go one by one. The people aspect. Um, risk management is a people-intensive process. You cannot leave it up to computers to, um, to do so. Um, and it is crucial that for the successful implementation, of risk management that you should have a solid uh, risk management team in place and this is not a full-time job. It is a few people within your company who once in a while will actually sit down together, understand the risk uh, management framework, implement it and provide the management or the owners some of their opinions about what are the key risks to the operations. As we said, we are here talking about um, micro and small companies. so a team with representatives from various departments of up to five, maybe maximum seven people is more than sufficient to cover um, the exercises for risk management or for the risk assessments and evaluation. Uh, and then have one person who will be the risk management officer or as I say, any other function within the company, but the person who will be in charge for actually following through uh, with the implementation of the treatment actions or with um, identifying when time is uh, adequate for reassessments of the risks and so on. Uh, from the policy aspect, uh, the company, in order to have a clear understanding of what is risk management and how it will be done within their company, should have some type of risk management policy, which should be simple enough but straightforward so that it summarizes the intent and the approach, how it will be done within the company. Um, in my experiences in the companies where we have implemented this, it is a one to two page document and it primarily focuses on the responsibilities of who is involved in the process. It uh, reflects the commitment of the management for risk or for assessments of the risks. It uh, also defines the level of acceptable risks for the company. Because this is necessary to know prior going into uh, the 
risk, evalu risk identification evaluation uh, activities to know what is acceptable for your company and what is not acceptable. Such definition can only be made by the owner or the management of the company. Nobody else can say okay, this is the level of acceptable risk for us. Uh, and also the policy should have reference to the methodology and the processes which will be used uh, and, how, uh, and how the specific risk will be evaluated. On the part of methodology and process, there are three main phases that um, should be considered. Uh, the first one is to, as I said, to establish the context, meaning define the scope of the operations, what will be covered by the risk management process. And as we are talking about micro and small enterprises, this by default should be the entire operations. Um, and also identify what are the specific uh, processes that we would like to cover. If you have a, a business process model, most of the or all of the processes listed there should be included. If you have an asset inventory or if you have a list of critical assets for your company, they should also be uh, included. It in, um, in setting this context for risk management and also the management team and the key staff or maybe all the staff even uh, depending on how, how big the company is. The second phase is the regular risk assessments which means that on the predefined intervals you should evaluate the risks. And how should you do this? You should start with evaluation of bare or um, bare risks which means risks without any uh, mitigations or any controls implemented. Um, for example, if you're looking at uh, if you're looking at the sales process again, uh, what is the risks for giving for publishing or giving to your clients an inadequate proposal? This is something that should be considered without taking into consideration that maybe your company has a quality assurance element that another employee is rereading the proposal just to check for spelling mistakes, adequacy in calculation and so on. So you have to evaluate what is the bare risk without any controls implemented. And then in the next, um, in the next step you will assess the impact of the risks with the current controls in place and then you will will ask yourself, well, okay, how much, what is the risk knowing that I do not only prepare proposals but also have um, a step for quality assurance before we issue them uh, and what is the level of risk afterwards? Why is it important to, to do both type of assessments? And a lot of companies where we have implemented it at the beginning think that this is doing twice the same job. It's not doing twice the same job because when you're identifying the bare risks you are, and then evaluating the current risks, you actually start to understand that your company has a lot of things already intuitively in place which are helping them lower the risks to which they're exposed. And such an exercise helps you clearly to identify which are those controls or which are those activities which you're doing that are actually intended to lower the risks of your operations, of your uh, processing of data for clients, of your IT services and so on. Um, and it also allows you to see is the investment in those controls adequate? Does it give you the effect which you want? Does it actually lower the risks? Is it making your operations more safe? Um, then coming to uh, the third step within phase two, it is um, to define what risk treatment options for those risks which are above the risk, uh, level of risks which is accepted to the company. And here the, uh, the company has to consider what type of options there are. Are they going to only uh, implement controls internally? Are they maybe going to outsource some of the risks by getting insurance? Are they going maybe to mitigate the risk with um, communicating with the partner what the risk is and how you can both work on it from each other's side? Um, and finally creating a risk treatment action plan with specific time frames, responsibilities and deadlines on how the controls which you have now identified should be implemented in the next period. 
this is actually the most common, the phase two is the most common uh, thing or the most common steps that you consider when you're thinking about risk management. But as you can see from the whole webinar, phase one and phase three are also important because with a bad phase one where you're establishing the context, uh, the phase two when you're actually doing the risk assessment can vary in scope significantly. And without the phase three, which is risk monitoring, you will have done the assessment and not see how correct you were, how uh, adequate the assessment was, how uh, actually the risks which happened in the next period impacted your company, or maybe uh, the effectiveness of the measures that you implemented, are they good or not. So, as I'm saying, in uh, phase three, the risk monitoring is actually at least every six months to do progress of how uh, the risk treatment plan has been implemented, have you done everything that you've planned, um, have the risks been uh, identified with the uh, right value because some of the risks might, might have occurred in the previous period, and are the controls effective. And if I have to choose between these three things, I would mostly focus on are controls effective because sometimes when we are thinking about a risk that we are exposed to, we choose some default control, uh, but then we do not recheck to see if we were correct, if that was an adequate control for the risks within your organization, within your context. Um, so as um, suggestions to um, owners and managers in micro and small IT intensive companies, I would actually um, tell them to focus on the risk monitoring, not so much on the risk assessment, because that is where you see, are you doing the right things and are they really effective? Are you spending your money wisely on um, risk management? Uh, let's go to see what are some of the main results of the process um, for risk management. One of the things that you will have is um, a risk uh, a process on, or asset register. You will have a risk register, definition of acceptable risk, and as I mentioned several times, risk treatment action plan, which will give you what are the things that you have to uh, implement or do within the next uh, few months. Um, so now coming towards the end of the um, presentation, what are the challenges for implementation? What I've seen from the experience in implementing risk management in various companies is that we always get stuck on valuation of assets or processes. How do you define how much value something has? Um, we tried a common sense approach, seeing how much money it costs, but then we get stuck with some old equipment which doesn't cost much money at the moment, but it's critical for the overall operations, or we get stuck when, you come, when we ask how much do the employees, what is the value of the employees. Uh, so here I would suggest for all those companies interested in implementation of such risk management uh, frameworks in their company, to actually use some relative uh, valuation of assets from 1 to 5 or from 1 to 10 so that you don't get so much into all the nitty-gritty things of how much does it cost or to, to skip the monetary assessment. Second challenge is the assessment of the impact. So, okay, now we understand how much the asset or the, the process or person is, uh, what is their value, but then we have to assess the the impact of the risk in something. Um, if you look at the frameworks which come from the financial sector, they always do the assessment of impact in money. This is very hard for uh, micro and small enterprises because they don't know how to do it usually, or they cannot express the value in money. Um, that's why what uh, I would suggest from the, um, from the experience which we have in other companies is to use what is the impact again from 1 to 5 or from 1 to 10 scale on the business operation, on the technical technical operations, on the reputation, because that is very important for a small and medium company. Um, and if you, you are really IT intensive or information intensive companies, use also the components of the information security risks, which is how much does that impact the confidentiality, integrity and availability of the information or of the asset that we're taking into um, consideration. 
And finally, uh, the biggest challenge uh, faced is the estimation of the effectiveness of the suggested mitigation measures or effectiveness of the controls. Have the money which we have invested in controls to lower the risk actually be effective? Um, for example, some of uh, the companies might identify fire as one of the risks which might happen to any to any one of us, and they invest in. Uh, this is when you have to say, well, let me think. Is that um, control effective? Can it actually lower the risks of having a fire in the premises? If you, the answer to all those questions was yes, then okay. If it was no, do not invest in a fire extinguisher. Think about how can you impact some other elements of the process which can lead to having the fire. Maybe um, separating the appliances which can cause fire from the paper and so on. Um, coming towards the towards the end, there is um, in order to have a little bit of a comprehensive risk management framework, it should be in some way supported with a tool. There's a lot of tools available out, uh, out there on the web, free for pay and so on. Um, but what we have seen is that most of them are made for big companies, which means that they are very heavy to use. Uh, they require a lot of time to input all the data. And that is why we recommend to um, uh, micro and small companies to actually create their own using Excel or some other um, commonplace uh, software which they use where they can in, uh, put the um, a process or asset register where they can have um, assessment of the risk in terms of value, uh, where they can also link to the measures which they're taking and uh, use the same sheet or the same uh, document for risk measurement and monitoring. Uh, one of the, those is on this slide. It's a very simple Excel sheet uh, that we have uh, created for some of our clients based on their um, needs. And I think that for micro and small companies, this is actually a good um, starting point because in a few sheets, they can have all the elements of the risk assessment or risk management framework that they need. And then as they grow, preferably they can switch to some more automated uh, tool. But for the time being, for the beginning steps in risk management, this is more than sufficient because it covers the risks. Um, what influences those risks, what are the risk factor, the basic risk itself without any controls, what they currently have as existing controls, and finally, what is the current risk. On the other sheets, uh, I'm not sure, maybe you can read at the bottom of the screen, there is the risk treatment plan, and finally, a risk treatment plan for the specific year to know what type of activities you have planned and what investments you should do for um, actually putting them into uh, into use. So I would like to stop here. I'm at my uh, at the end of my time, but I would like to open the floor for some questions, if there are any. Thank you very much, Miss Yasmina. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, we do actually have some questions. Um, the first question is, uh, my organization has been practicing risk management for several years. Does the advent of ISO 31000 mean we need to start again? Um, well, it doesn't mean that they have to start again, because if they look at ISO 31000, they will see that it actually is um, very common sense, and it will most probably reflect 90% of what they have been doing at the moment. So for companies that are doing any type of risk management, uh, looking at ISO 31000 can be beneficial simply because it will tell you how what is the terminology which is used uh, and which then is consistently used for all other ISO standards. So, for example, if they, this company wants to implement ISO 9001 based on the newest edition, which is risk-based, they can identify their practices within um, the requirement in ISO 9000 simply by comparing what they're doing with ISO 31000 and seeing if they have all the steps. What I have generically find, found in uh, companies is that maybe they don't do the first phase exactly, 
uh, as detailed as the standards requires, um, and that was about setting the context, meaning identifying for which processes and for which asset, for which environment that risk um, management is being conducted, and they might not do the monitoring as defined in the standard, but the steps for the risk assessment, the second phase there, most of the companies are doing it in the same way as described in the standard, because it is common sense, as I say. I hope I answered the question. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is, how do you manage risk with low probability and very high impact, especially when the customer asks you, what is the probability for it to happen? Oh, that, that's a difficult question because um, what is the probability? Um, can it, it depends who you ask. So, for example, for some things you can go and look at historical figures. What is the probability of something happening? Going into the past and seeing how often has it happened in the last three years, five years, ten years. Um, but for some newer companies, they might not have such data. So they cannot go back and say, in the last three years, we have had this many incidents of that type, which means that the probability for it happening in the next year is this much. Um, so it is something which is very subjective. Uh, and the company has to, based on their experience and knowledge of their processes, define the probability for themselves. Um, and then together with the partner or the client which is requesting um, some action, some mitigation of that risk, define what is the most reasonable risk regarding not only what they would like to see but also how much are they willing to spend on it. Because the company can say yes, we can implement additional mitigation measures but that will cost you. Because if you want assurance that this low probability, high impact risk will never, never, never happen, then we have to do some other things. But we think that, for example, the level of investment we have made in mitigation at the moment is sufficient. If you don't think so, please have in mind that it might impact your price. And this is also uh, connected with the service level agreements. If the company is in the service sector, they might uh, reflect that in the service level agreement in terms of pricing. Thank you very much. Uh, we have two questions regarding the CIA. The first one is uh, what CIA stands for, and the second one is um, I didn't clearly listen to what CIA B mean on the Axel risk assessment. Could you please repeat it? Okay. So, um, as we said at the beginning, we are talking about IT intensive micro and small companies. IT intensive means that the elements of information security risk management can also be implemented. And within the standards for information security risk management, they have identified three main um, impact factors for risk, and that is confidentiality of the information being processed, availability of uh, confidentiality, integrity of the information being processed, and availability of that information. So the CIA in the risk assessment was regarding to that. Thank if you. the company decides that those concepts are important or relevant for their work. We have found that in IT intensive companies they are applicable because most of the processes and assets of value are regarding maintaining information, processing information or the information itself. So that's why we, in this proposed tool and in the proposed uh, framework, we are including um, the confidentiality, integrity, availability, uh, as one of the risk factors aside of business, operations, uh, and reputation. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, based on the tool share, can you highlight an example from the sheet? Okay, let me see. An example from the sheet. Um, okay, I will try for the last one, uh, the last row. Um, you cannot see because it's not fully open, but if you look at the last row of the Excel sheet, which is on the screen, it talks about electronic information. So uh, information in electronic form, specifically um, customer data. And it says here, so you don't see it in the blank spot there, it's customer data in electronic form. The value of that asset is the highest. 
because this company has been using a scale from one to five, so it says five for the value of the asset. The threat is that it is being stolen. Um, likelihood is from zero to three, so here is the highest likelihood. It's without any uh, controls being implemented, it's very likely that customer information can be stolen from this company. Um, what the consequence will be, it says uh, unavailability of the needed information, decreasing competitive uh, advantage and so on. And here we have identified that it will have a high impact or a three on the confidentiality, a low impact on the uh, integrity because it won't be changed, it simply won't be there, it will be stolen. It will have a high impact on the availability factor and a medium impact on the business factor. So. Now, having all this in mind, um, they're using a calculation that um, it is the value of the asset times the likelihood of occurrence of the risk times the sum of all the risk factors. It comes to a number of 135, which within their um, level of acceptable risk means that this is a high risk for the company. So the last part of the, the sheet shows what kind of existing controls or existing measures they have implemented uh, to lower these risks. And they have implemented um, additional access control, like firewall and passwords, improved practice of using USB sticks, and um, some other, which I cannot read at the moment on this sheet. And they have then reevaluated the risk factors, knowing what are all these controls which they have implemented. So they said, okay, now having all this into consideration, uh, for all factors, there is, um, for all risk factors, we feel that the value is low, one, and that brings us to an overall current risk for having stolen electronic version of um, customer data at 60, which within their um, ranking was a medium level risk. This was presented to the top management of the company uh, and they said, okay, we would still like to lower it. So then within the next sheet, um, they had defined uh, some additional control measures, how to get the 60 to come down to a 30 or 35, because that was the level of the risk that they would like to accept. Was this other Yes, we will answer uh, two other questions. Uh, the next one is, uh, instead of creating risk items in risk register, do you believe to establish risk catalog, uh, which ETA includes uh, risk profiles? That can also be done, but uh, what I have found is that it requires higher knowledge on the side of the participants in the risk management team. If, um, if those members were actually doing the risk risk assessment can define risk profiles, then that is also a good way to proceed. If not, then this is maybe the first step. So then the company, within a year or two, when they get a hang of how risk management is being done, can switch from um, asset registers to uh, risk profiles. So, But it simply depends on what the company knows how to do, what they feel comfortable with. Um, thank you. And the last question is, is there any main risk catalog? Um, I don't like using um, predefined risk catalogs because then the company does not think about what the risks are but simply chooses them from the list. Um, what we prefer with uh, micro and small companies to do is actually sit in a workshop and go through this together because it is a learning experience. And in such cases, uh, just by talking uh, among each other on what the risks are and how to deal with them, they come up with solutions and we think that it has much more value for the company than doing this uh, from a predefined catalog or doing this in their name without their involvement. Um, so it's. I don't know how, how to say a yes no to that. Uh, thank you, Yasmina, again for this highly informative webinar. Uh, and I want to thank all the attendees as well who have taken time off your busy schedules to 
participate. I hope and I'm sure you have learned something new today. This webinar is also recorded and can be found on our YouTube channel. Don't forget to check back uh, on our upcoming webinars and topics of your interest by visiting visiting our website or social media pages uh, www.pcb.com meet you all again same day same same day same time next week on a topic of ISO 31000 the benchmark for risk management in uncertain times i'm looking forward to seeing you all next week until then have a great week thank you thank you